Hi everyone, I'm Jamie Pound from the UK and I'm based um, in Hertfordshire and I run a couple of dog schools and I run UK sniffer dogs. So I'm going to be talking to you guys about the benefits of scent detection for pet owners, pet dogs and pet dog trainers. And UK sniffer dogs has its five free scent exercises for you to do at home with your dog, which we're going to be giving away as our free gift. And before I get started, I just wanted to um, tell you a little bit more about myself and how I got into dog training and scent training, because I think it ties in quite nicely with what um, I'm going to be talking about. So 10 years ago, I was caught in a fire at work, um, an electrical explosion. So I used to be an electrician and I was burnt 45% of my body. It affected me mentally and physically for years. And you can see the picture on the, on the right there that um, back in 2010, I don't look very happy at all, do I? Um, but I struggled to motivate myself um, to get out and talk to people, socialize, exercise, and even work. I wasn't sure how my life was going to pan out. Um, and at 23 years old, I was a bit lost. But this little lad, uh, Frankie, who you can see here, he got me up in the morning. He gave me a purpose um, and gave me a bit of self-worth. And, and I needed to get up in the morning. I needed to get him out for his walk. And he needed his training. Um, so gave me something to do. And Frankie was a reactive dog. And we used to find quiet places in the woods where there was nobody about, where we would let him off the lead and have a bit of a laugh with him, whether it was finding his toy, playing tug, or um, just generally going off and sniffing and chasing bunny rabbits and sniffing squirrels and whatever it was. But he wasn't a dog that I could just take to the local dog park and let off the lead. And um, he wasn't a social dog, let's say. But I wanted to help him and I wanted to um, understand why my dog was like this. He was a little bit reactive towards other dogs and people. So I trained to become a dog trainer. Um, so whilst going through my rehabilitation, I trained to become a dog trainer just to understand a little bit more about my dog and make his life better. Training dogs was my happy place. Okay, it gave me some self-worth and it made me feel good. I loved seeing the results that me and Frankie got from our different, um, different types of training. We did trick training, we did obedience training, we did hill work, um, we did some bike work training, and we also did scent work. And scent work became um, my favorite thing to do. Um, and it was definitely Frankie's favorite thing to do. So making dogs happy made me happy. And it was a mindfulness exercise for me, and it still is. So getting out there and playing with my dogs makes me feel good and just gives me a break away from the everyday um, problems in my life. And later, it might make a bit more sense when I liken this um, to scent detection for pet dogs. So whilst I was training um, to become a dog trainer, I met my wife, Gemma. Um, who was a veterinary nurse at the time, and she was also training to become a dog trainer. And the, her and Frankie got on well, um, and she, was, she won't mind me using this picture of her. One of my most favorite things to see is an owner down on the floor playing with their dog um, and just enjoying the moment. And those two definitely had lots of that together, and Frankie loved her um, just as much as she loved him. So it was a great relationship that I saw build between the two of them. And me and Gemma set up Chorley with Dog Training in 2013. And more recently, we've set up Burke Hampstead Dog Training. So we've got two dog schools. Um, and over those two dog schools, we, we teach puppies. Um, and we have an, from there, we have beginners, puppies, improvers, and advanced classes. We have about 200 dogs a week um, in the dog schools. And we also teach scent detection classes. Both dog schools now run under Jamie Pound Dog Training, um, and hopefully we'll add some more dog schools in the future um, as the business grows more. And I've been teaching pet dog owners now full-time for eight years. 
and my passions are running classes for pet dog owners um, and dogs to enjoy. I work with rescue dogs and reactive dogs and I love doing this and I love seeing um, problem behaviours that we can resolve and general behaviour um, that we look to resolve with the owners. And most of all though, I love teaching scent detection to pet dog owners because I think it has so many benefits, not only for the dog, but also for the owner. And we now run UK Sniffer Dogs um, scent detection for pet dogs. UK Sniffer Dogs has been training dog trainers how to teach scent detection in their dog training businesses successfully now since 2018. And we've got over 100 instructors in the UK and a few other countries in Europe now teaching UK Sniffer Dogs classes um, in their businesses um, weekly to pet dogs. So UK Sniffer Dogs, uh, we're going to talk about the benefits of scent detection for pet owners, pet dogs and pet dog trainers. So what is scent detection used for? Scent detection has been widely used across the world for many years for working and operational services. Our amazing dogs have been used to search for drugs, bombs, firearms, cash, contraband, missing people and human remains. Even more amazingly, in recent years, dogs are now being used for assistance purposes with their nose. So medical alert, diabetes and epilepsy, epilepsy in humans. And medical detection, such as detecting cancer cells in humans. That for me is just wow, okay? The fact that we've been able to uh, utilize that dog's nose to benefit in us in so many ways as humans is brilliant. And we aim to give owners the skills to train and take part in scent training activities with their dogs, just like working sniffer dogs. We've been using scent detection and scent activities with our dogs in classes and one-to-ones successfully for over five years. And it's now become one of the first things that we recommend to most dog owners. Any dog can do it and any dog will enjoy and benefit from the results of engaging with their amazing nose. So let's talk a little bit about the amazing nose these dogs have. So this diagram here, um, you can see um, those colored um, balls which represent scent particles. And the dog's taking those scent particles in, up the nose, and they're traveling straight up that nose to the brain where they're processed by the dog. And when I look at this picture, I think about the different colored balls being different scents in that environment. So we could think that the yellow um, balls might be the scent that the dog's looking for. Whereas the pink and the purple balls might be just distraction scents that are in our environment. So the dog's got to take all those scent particles in and then it's got to sort through them and process them to locate um, what it's looking for. And our dogs have up to 3 million scent receptors rather than our 6 million. They also have the ability to take air in and breathe out simultaneously. Using the little slits at the side of their nose, um, the dogs can take air in through the nostrils and chuck air out of the slits at the side of the nose at the same time. So, and then the part of the dog's brain which is responsible for interpreting these scents is 40 times larger than ours. And that's the olfactory bulb. So you can see um, the dog's brain on the left here, um, the smaller brain, and you can see that large blue dot or blue bulb at the front of the dog's brain. That is the olfactory bulb. And then on the right, you can see the human brain and you can see that tiny little weeny pin sized dot of an olfactory bulb that we have. So their olfactory bulb is a lot larger than ours and it takes up a lot bigger surface area of their brain than ours does. And then the dog's nose has two main regions, okay? The respiratory region for breathing and the olfactory region for processing. So the yellow bit at the back of the dog's, at the back of this diagram here you can see is the olfactory region. And the pink bit in front is the um, respiratory region. 
Now, dogs can also amazingly separate the air that's breathed in into two portions. 12% go into the olfactory region for processing and 88% to the respiratory region for breathing. Now, in this diagram, you can see the blue um, path lines of air are your respiratory path lines. And then the red path lines are your olfactory path lines, which are going up to the olfactory region. Dogs also have an extra olfactory organ, which is called the vomonasal organ, or more commonly, the Jacobson organ. This is situated in the roof of the mouth and it's responsible for detecting pheromones. This organ has helped dogs survive for years. It can help them discern between potential predators and potential mates. It can recognize emotional states in other dogs, as well as other animals and including humans. It can recognize when we're stressed or angry um, or upset or sad or happy. And, um, it's now being used to detect other things, uh, uh, pheromones in, that we might give off um, when we're ill, and it can detect certain illnesses. So let's move on to um, the benefits of it then and, and how it can help our dogs. So one of my passions I mentioned earlier is reactive dogs. And the reason I got into this was because of reactive dogs. And there's a study that was done by um, Alex Horowitz and Charlotte Duranton. They named it Let Me Sniff, which is a brilliant title. And it's called Nosework Induces Positive Judgment Bias in Pet Dogs. Now, this is just an extract of the full study. And I'll give you the link in a second to where you can see the full study. But... If I just read through this extract, one species is often forgotten in the category of captive animals, domestic dogs. Pet dogs can be considered captive in so far that they cannot choose their daily activities, nor do they generally have the opportunity to express natural behaviours necessary for their welfare, such as the olfactory behaviour. In this study, they tested the effect of an olfaction-based activity on pet dogs' emotional states. Dogs were given a cognitive bias test, then practiced a daily specified activity for two weeks, and then finally given a cognitive bias test again. The activity conducted differed between the two groups. Dogs from the experimental group practiced nose work, and the dogs from the control group practiced heel work. The results showed that the latency to approach the ambiguous stimulus declined significantly after treatment in the experimental group, whereas the latency did not change for the dogs in the control group. So we conclude that allowing dogs to spend more time using their olfaction through regular nose work activity makes them more optimistic. So by allowing more, our dogs more foraging time, generally their welfare is improved. So that's the link to the full study there at www.sciencedirect.com um, where you can see it for yourself. And um, I think it's brilliant. It really, really puts the science behind why scent detection is good for all dogs. And I want to talk a little bit now about reactivity in class without nose work. So what we do in our general behavior class is to accommodate reactive dogs and help the reactive dogs cope with the class situation and, and improve. So my classes are very well spread out. So this is a picture of one of my classes. I've got six handlers in that class. And normally I have the reactive dogs. If we've got one or two reactive dogs, they would be on the end of our mark pole setup. And we might even have them a little bit further away than the rest of the group. And over the weeks, we try and move them in and get them a bit closer. And it does depend on the activity that we're doing. So if we're doing stays, um, you know, the reactive dogs generally cope a lot better than if the dogs are doing things like recalls or retrieving, where there's a little bit more animation in the other dogs. 
So we would judge the distance accordingly and move the dogs further away um, for certain exercises and bring them in closer when they can cope. And generally with reactivity, um, we would work on the dog um, desensitizing him to these triggers. So focus on the handler rather than focusing on the triggers. We did an exercise with the reactive dogs called look at that. So every time the dog would look towards the trigger before it reacted, we would click and reward the dog. And then the dog would look at the trigger and we would click and we would reward the dog. And as a byproduct of that, what happens is the dog goes, looks at the trigger and before the click can go off, instead of reacting, he looks at the handler and then we can reward for focus on that handler instead. And we would work the dog at, at distance, like we said, from the rest of the dogs in class. And gradually over the weeks, we um, would get them a little bit closer. And these dogs would be reactive because of visual or visual stimulus or, or audible stimulus. So something they hear or something they see. So then we think about UK sniffer dogs, scent classes. And these are open for reactive dogs again, and we work the dogs at the distance that they can cope with. And as you can see, it's a very similar setup. And we would possibly put the reactive dogs on the end again um, and give them more space if needed. But what do we teach in these scent classes? We teach scent recognition, we teach indications, and we teach searches. So we don't necessarily target reactivity specifically like we would in the behavior classes, but we see much more of an improvement. So the searches, we cover them. We do some pipe searches um, where we line up um, some plumbing pipes and we'll hide out our scent and the dog has to work down and indicate on the correct pipe. We do chair searches and it could be some plastic chairs or it could be some chairs that are in the environment. Um, so this is a football stadium um, and we work a little bit of a lineup down the down a, a row of seating in the football stadium and the dog's got to indicate on the on the scent when it finds it working down that lineup of chairs we do bag searches so it could be um, hanging bags could be rucksacks could be paper bags could be poo bags could be um, treat bags could be rucksacks so any type of bag we can work on and we can work on indication searches um, with our dogs. We do vehicle searches. and I love this picture. You can see um, if you look really, really closely at the end of that dog's nose, the, the odor is hidden um, just in that um, locking wheel nut on the alloy wheel there. And you can see the dog's eyes waiting for that reward. That's his indication and he's found. So, Vehicle searches, which owners can do on their own vehicles out on their driveway quite easily. And then novel environments is one of my favorite things to teach with the, with the owners and get them out there doing. It's one of my favorite things to do with my own dogs. And I think it's brilliant for reactive dogs, brilliant for nervous dogs, rescue dogs, puppies, because we're playing a game that the dog um, is going to love and understand in different environments. So we're putting a positive spin on different environments and desensitizing them to different things that they might come across. There's another novel environment. Love that picture. Boxer. Um, if you've ever heard of boxer's nose work. <laughs> so I call that nose muscles. When the dogs are working, in, uh, working those nostrils in, uh, simultaneously to the, the slits in the side of the nose, chucking out air at the same time as taking it in. Um, you can hear those nose muscles go, and I love hearing a boxer sniff. And then indications. So this uh, is Frankie, and what we generally try and teach on our indications is with our handlers, is we teach the duration of the indication. So on a blind search, we want a nice strong indication so that when we don't know where the hide is, that we're going to be, it's going to be really clear to us that our dog's found. So we want to prove that indication by adding duration to it. Distance of indication, so how far can your dog indicate away from you? It's going to be very different to um, a dog on a two meter line to a 10 meter line. And then distractions that your dog can cope with whilst he's indicating. 
Um, and that can come across with just working in new environments or it could be stuff that we put in. So those natural, those general things that we put into a sit stay, um, I don't know, sit stay the dog whilst you do five star jumps. Can your dog indicate whilst you do five star jumps? And one of the things I wanted to mention on here was um, a little story about Frankie. And when I was working on indication with him, and if we were working on indication, duration of the indication, on a pipe. So I was looking for a longer indication. Um, he would do something which was, which was quite fascinating for me. So his nose would go in the pipe and he would indicate on scent. And then I would start counting. And let's say um, I've just got a five second indication and I now want to improve that indication to an eight second indication or a 10 second indication. <clears throat> he would indicate on the pipe and I would start to count my counting. And I'd go one, two, three, four, five. And then Frankie would go and sniff again. <laughs> and I'd go six, seven, eight, yes, and then reward the dog. So for him, what, what was amazing for me there is what I've actually trained is the dog to sniff the scent pays out. And when we were working on duration, if I hadn't paid him out yet, he would take another nose forward out air and then exhale again. Um, and it really does make a, a good big sound when the dog's nose is in that scent pipe. So, and then uh, this was mentioned earlier on in the week um, when Steve White was talking and it was a brilliant presentation, Steve. Um, really, really interesting. And I love some of the, the, the bits that you put in there. But pre-existing training was one of the things that he mentioned will affect the dog's indications. So Frankie was trained to do a freeze. Okay, so if the scent was quite low, um, he would probably go into a down and freeze or do some sort of bow and freeze. And if the scent was quite high, he would possibly sit and point towards it. Now, when the scent was out of reach, so it was out of, um, inaccessible from height, this is what Frankie did. So I hadn't trained him to beg as an indication, but I had trained him as a trick dog and he could beg. So where the hide was depended on how or what his indication looked like. It was still a freeze, but his body would probably be doing something slightly different. Um, and this indication here was on an aeroplane and the hide was just up above the light there above Frankie's head. And you can see he's pointing his nose directly to where that is. Um, and he sat himself up in a bag um, and just froze. And for me, that was probably the best indication I've ever seen um, from one of my dogs there. He was, it was brilliant. Um, and I love looking back at that picture. And I wish I'd have videoed it. <laughs> now, Scent work classes then. We work the dogs at distance on group exercises and then all the dogs step back whilst the reactive dog comes up to search. And if the reactive dog was working on a search and a dog comes past the trigger line for that dog, the reactive dog is more likely to ignore that dog and just carry on with his job than if he was in an obedience class. And with reactive dogs, we want them to disengage visually on their environment and feel more relaxed. And whatever the trigger is, instead of barking and lunging, we want the dog to put his nose down instead and get on with the job in hand. And that comes naturally when the dog's enjoying the job he's doing and he's feeling comfortable about what he's doing. And if scent work makes him feel better, he's going to be more optimistic in that situation. And we had um, something like this happen in one of our classes with a reactive dog. And let's say week one, uh, reactive dog Tulsa, <clears throat> it, the owner of it was, was about 20 meters away from the rest of the dogs when he was working. And when we brought him up for his search, um, we would ask all the other handlers to move back. And one day I asked all the handlers to move back and then um, called Tulsa up for our search. 
But the handler that was going next with her dog realized she didn't have any treats left in her pocket. And she wanted to run off to her car to get some treats before it was her go. And Tulsa started searching and this handler decided to take her dog straight across the field, quite close to Tulsa while she was searching to go back to her car to get treats. I held my breath and was like, Ugh! the handler held the breath and was like, Ugh! the dog, Tulsa, looked up at the handler that was walking past with her dog, didn't react, didn't even bat an eyelid, went, oh, there's a dog there, got back to her job. And um, the lady, bless her, the handler that, that did um, run across the park, uh, realised what she did straight away as soon as me and the, ha the other handler looked at her and she froze and was like, oh, and I was like, just keep going, just keep going. Um, because the dog hadn't reacted and the dog just got back to its job. And we were all like, oh my God, did you see that? Did you see Tulsa just totally ignore that dog there and just crack on with her job? Um, and for me, that was a wow moment in our training class. And from that day forward, um, the handler with Tulsa felt a lot more relaxed and we felt a little bit more relaxed and we, we didn't need to give Tulsa as much space as we had previously. Um, and nose work was doing its job, basically. It was targeting that re reactivity, was making the dog feel better and we hadn't done anything specific on reactivity with that dog in that situation. So reactive dogs... Um, it's great mental stimulation for dogs on lead. So if you've got a dog that you can't let off lead, it's a great way of working that dog and tiring that dog out, giving that dog extra stimulation on lead in different environments. Confidence building. So reactivity stems from the dog being less confident. Um, and if we can make that dog more confident, it's going to be less reactive. Less visual on um, environmental triggers. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, dogs are reactive to visual triggers and visual stimuluses or audible stimuluses. And if a dog can be less visual and more olfactory, they're going to be less reactive in that environment. And then not to mention bond strengthening and building bond building between the handler and dog. Okay. And the handler observing the dog's body language on searches. Steve mentioned this the other day, watching all the different dogs is, is something that I really enjoy as well. And um, different dogs search in different ways and they all have their own natural indicators. And we teach owners to pick up on these different types of body language and these, body, these changes of um, behavior in our dogs before the dog finds or whilst the dog's picking up on the scent. And as the owners start noticing this body language in searches, they also start noticing other types of body language, um, which is going to help them pick up when their dog's going to react um, or when their dog's unhappy or unease. And most of all, for reactive dogs, scent work is calming. Okay, so if we can um, make those reactive dogs feel better, they're going to succeed um, or be more optimistic to succeed in different environments. Now, scent work for puppies then. So I've talked a lot more about, I've talked a lot about reactivity. Um, so I'm now going to talk a little bit more because reactivity is my passion. It's the reason I got into scent training and I love working with reactive dogs. But remember, scent work should be accessible for all dogs and puppies. I get this question all the time. Oh, when can I start with my puppy? Now, why not? Start straight away. Okay, my puppy I've got at the minute, he's 14 weeks and I've been doing scent work with him now for since I had him. So for, for six weeks, since he was eight weeks old. Um, it's a mental workout for that puppy. We all know that we can't exercise puppies um, for long periods of time. We can't go out for an hour's walk, but we can do mental work with the puppies and blast that brain. Um, Socialisation with new environments. So... When we start working on searches in different locations, um, if the dog's going to be enjoying his game, he's going to be, uh, we're going to be making fun for the dog in new places, which is, is what 
what we do when we get a pup. We want to go out and socialize it and habituate it. And what better way of habituating your dog to play search, search games with him in different environments? Um, confidence. So building confidence in these puppies. And then the biggest one for me at the minute, which I'm dealing with, if you look at my hands, um, it's a mutually exclusive behavior to the puppy biting you. Okay, so if your puppy is sniffing um, and busy using his nose, he's not going to be biting you. Okay, um, I use snuffle mats and scatter feeding and hide and seek type games with the puppies to get them um, active with their nose and get them using that nose just to give them that extra little bit of stimulation. And this is one of the puppies, um, I think he was about four months old here, um, and he came to one of our instructor's courses with his handler, um, dog trainer, Debbie. And he was the youngest dog on the course. And he was picking things up quicker than some of the older dogs that had had lots of other training. And remember, pre-existing training can get in the way of scent work sometimes. Um, and normally it's the agility dogs and the trick dogs that are so proactive and want to do something for us for their treat rather than sniff. Um, whereas with this puppy, blank canvas, new environments, same game, smashed it every single time. And this was him working at Milton Keynes Football Club, really big location, um, could be quite um, intimidating for some puppies. And he absolutely smashed it. Um, finding every single hide that we put out for him um, and we built him up into different um, environments, different searches. And he amazed us all, to be honest, and he was the youngest dog on the course. And then rehabilitation, um, surgery of, of surgery, or for older dogs, okay? So again, it's a mental workout for these older dogs. Rather than taking them for an hour run, we can play 10 minutes of scent work in the back garden and we're going to be doing more, um, less damage to our, our dogs and more, more stimulation, more brain work, making them feel good about themselves rather than coming back with aches and pains. It's low impact and stretches. So I mentioned earlier about Frankie when the hide was at different heights, how it would affect his indication. And so we could put out a hide at a certain height for the dog to stretch to. And if the dog's had a certain operation and we need to start moving his head in a certain way or his neck in a certain way or his, his body in a certain way, we can use scent to um, get the dog to stretch in that certain direction. And we always hear, oh, the dog's following his nose. And when the dog follows his nose, the body follows. And the body follows in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways, which I love to watch all the different dogs um, present. It's an on-lead exercise for restricted movement. So if you've got a dog that's just had surgery and you've been told by the vet you, you've got to restrict his movement and he must stay on lead, it's a great exercise for you to be doing with your dog. It can be adapted and, uh, to suit any dog and it can be done anywhere. So for me, scent work is the best thing that we can do with our dogs. For older dogs, uh, younger dogs, reactive dogs, extra exuberant dogs, any dog. And then rescue rehabilitation. So it's a great mental stimulation, again, for dogs that need to be on lead. A lot of rescue centers will say to you when you get your rescue dog, do not let him off the lead, okay? You won't see him again. Um, and then the owners are like, oh, how am I going to tire him out? Oh, dog, the dog needs to go out for a run, and they start feeling guilty. But if we teach them, teach the owners, um, and, and make them understand that the dogs don't need to go out and run around like a lunatic off the lead, but they need mental stimulation. And that can be done on the lead, anywhere, anytime, any place. Um, and it's going to be confidence building for that rescue dog. Bond strengthening. Um, again, and building that between the handler and dog. You know, these rescue dogs are going to have possibly um, negativity towards certain their new owners because of how they've been treated in the past. And we want to build that strength. And what better way 
than to give the dogs something, a game to play with us that makes them feel good. Um, observing the dog's body language on different searches, again, helps the owner notice different body language in their dog in everyday life, when the dog's scared or when the dog's nervous. It's calming and it's stress relieving. So there we go. Um, scent detection could be used for any dog. And um, these were two rescue dogs that I worked with last year. And this is a kennels out in Cyprus. And really, really good kennels, second chance dogs. And two completely different dogs. So the dog um, that you can see me there with on the lead is a dog called Johnny English. And he's a, he was a seven-year-old um, Malinois. Um, he's, prob he's still there. Um, so I say was, I say was because he's probably about eight now, but he um, was very stressed in his kennel and he had a big black Kong that he would have in his mouth um, all the time. And when somebody walked past his kennel, he'd pick up that big black Kong and he would spin and spin and spin and spin and spin. And it was just his, his stress, um, stressy, stressiness in him, in him really. And I pulled that dog out. I said, okay, let, can we do some scent work with him? And he said, are you sure you want to do it with Johnny? Friggin' hell. Um, he's nuts. <laughs> I was like, I can see, but I think he's going to be brilliant and I think he's going to enjoy it. Um, so we pulled Johnny out and we did a few searches with Johnny. And after each search, when he found his, his scent, we rewarded him and he came away from the search chair and he picked up his big black Kong and he spun and he spun and he spun and he spun. And we did about four to five searches with him. And after search five, we come away from the search area and I was expecting him just to drag me across the, um, across the floor there um, to his black Kong where he would pick it up and spin again. And he didn't. He just sat and he relaxed by my side. He picked up his black Kong and he spun it out of my feet and was saying, come on then, let's play again. And I saw that dog relax and he leant into my side and I felt him relax. Um, and it was the most relaxed I've, ever, I've seen him since I was there. And the people that knew him a lot more than me were all amazed with what they saw. And what I love is that the um, kennel hands at this place have carried this on and they are carrying on to do scent work with him. And he's a lot less stressed in his kennel environment now um, than he was before because he's getting that um, olfactory um, based activity daily, which is mindfulness for him. And it's his way of getting away from his stressy kennel. Um, and it's brilliant. It's also something that they can do with the dog in the kennel. Okay. So it can be done in a small, um, in a really small environment. You don't need a big space to play scent work with our dogs. And then uh, Spike um, is the other German Shepherd you can see here. And he was a um, very nervous, timid um, Shepherd. And he, really sweet Shepherd, to be honest. He didn't want to work. He just wanted to cuddle. Um, but he could be quite spooked quite easily. Um, from quick movements because he didn't know if he was going to be grabbed and shoved in a kennel or or treated badly by that human um, from whatever he'd had in the past before he was rescued by this rescue and we got him out and we did some searches with him and it was a lot slower and a lot slower paced than with Johnny um, but equally he found it just as rewarding and he, although he would search and do his job and then just want to lean into you for cuddles, you could see that the more we did with him, the more he wanted to do it. And um, two completely different dogs there, different mental states, and scent work definitely benefited both of those in the kennels. And there's me and Johnny working um, on a search there. Love that dog. And I'm hopefully I'm going back to see him very, very soon. So scent detection is mindfulness is a mindfulness exercise for all dogs, which is what working with dogs was for me and still is. So I owe it to dogs to give them more positive scent experiences, in turn building stronger bonds, um, giving stress relief 
and exercise to our dogs with UK Sniffer Dogs. A UK Sniffer Dogs mission statement is to improve dogs' lives through nose work. By applying our knowledge as dog trainers and scent instructors, we've developed a program that will enable owners to give their dogs positive scent experiences, not only teaching them to work and play with scent, but using scent to rectify problems in pet dogs when it comes to behavior. So I think we owe it to our dogs to let them sniff. Um, and what I wanted to leave you with today was a few fun facts um, about the dog's nose. So these are some of the, there's, there's tons of facts out there, but these are some really, these are some of my favorites. So if we use vision as an example, so humans are very visual and if we can relate things to vision um, quite a lot, it helps them understand it. So if we use vision as an example, what you and I see at a third of a mile, a dog could see more than 3000 miles away and still see it well. So for your information, that's around the same distance of London to New York. <laughs> wow. huh? And then they can smell 100,000 times better than us. Their nose is so sensitive that it can detect half a teaspoon of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. And um, I used to have sugar in my tea. I don't anymore. But um, now if somebody puts a sugar in my tea, I can just about smell it. And I might have to taste it to work out if there's sugar in it or not. Some people say they can smell it instantly and humans can smell a teaspoon of sugar in a tea. But dogs can smell half a teaspoon of sugar in an Olympic sized swimming pool. That is amazing, huh? And then um, dogs can smell the time. That's right, smell, not tell. They can track the time from odors in the environment. Now, let's think about this. For example, as the sun makes a journey, makes its journey over your house, it will heat up different areas of the room. And at particular times of the day, it will release different scents. The movement of those odors is detectable to our dogs. That's genius. Um, and then dogs smell in 3D, just as we see in 3D. Our eyes see um, layers okay so I can see right now I can see my laptop on my desk and I've got some pictures behind that and there's a mirror behind that and then there's a wall um, and if I look in my garden I can see the garden then I can see the fence at the back and then I can see that there's trees behind that fence dogs can smell through layers okay so just as we see in 3d our eyes see two slightly different pictures and our brain puts them together to make one picture, uh, sorry, our brain puts them together to make one picture. The dog's, nos the dog's nostrils can work independently and their brain puts together the scents to help them figure out where the scent is that they're looking for. And then if you were to roll out the human's olfactory region flat, it would be about the size of an A4 piece of paper. If we rolled out the dog's olfactory region, it would be about the size of a football pitch. So our free gift from www.uksnifferdogs.com is um, our five free exercises. So how you can find, if you go to our website and you click the um, tab there saying for dog owners, you'll come up with some of our online courses um, available for dog owners. And the free one there is our five free exercises, free scent exercises for you to do at home with your dog on, in lockdown. Okay, so you can share that with your clients um, and give them some ideas of what they can do with their dog whilst we're going through this difficult period. Um, and when they purchase it, they won't get charged anything. Um, they'll sign up to the website, they'll create themselves account, an account, and when they log in, you um will be greeted with your course and this is the layout so this is exercise one it's the high intensity search training and exercise two is ham tracking i won't give away all the exercises um, but you'll see a video and some written instructions of each exercise so grab yourselves the uk sniffer dogs five 
free scent exercises to do with your dog at home um, from www.ukcnifferdogs.com and um, get cracking with your dogs. And then if you are um, the owner of a reactive dog or even you think your dog might be reactive, then get in touch with Reactive Dog, um, Reactive Dogs UK. You can find them on Facebook or online at rduk.online. If you're wanting some emotional support, um, RDUK is the most safe and supportive online community for reactive dog owners. RDUK also provides one-to-one professional advice and extensive professional resources for their members to give you professional online guidance that you can trust. Plus, they can help you find great trainers for when you want live one-to-one training and help um, with your dog. So there, I wanna say thank you um, to the Virtual Dog Conference for having me um, with this talk. Um, Thank you to RDUK and thank you everybody for watching today.